Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about how the genomic era is changing our approach to axillary management. These are my disclosures. So management of the axilla has evolved dramatically over the last 30 years from the routine use of axillary dissection to sentinel node biopsy for staging patients as node negative, to sentinel node biopsy as therapy for patients with limited amounts of axillary disease, and as a way to determine who is downstaged from neoadjuvant therapy and doesn't require axillary dissection. But now in the genomic era, we're faced with the question of whether or not we can eliminate sentinel node biopsy entirely, or in fact, does precision medicine call for knowledge of the exact number of involved axillary nodes in some patients? And in thinking about this question, it's useful to think about why historically we've performed axillary surgery. Initially, we felt it improves survival, it maintains local control in the axilla, and it provides prognostic information, which helps to determine adjuvant therapy. Now, we have known since the classic NSABP B04 trial that axillary dissection, in fact, did not change survival when comparing women randomized to classic radical mastectomy or total mastectomy alone or total mastectomy plus nodal irradiation through follow-up of 25 years. This study did not actually change practice because at that time, nodal metastases were considered an indication for systemic therapy. But we've seen this principle re-demonstrated again more recently in the ACASOG Z11 and AMAROS trials, where patients with involvement of one or two sentinel nodes were randomized to classic axillary dissection or sentinel node biopsy alone in the case of Z11, or with radiotherapy in the case of Amaros, and again, with follow-ups through 10 to 12 years, we see no survival differences. So if axillary dissection isn't necessary for survival or axillary surgery doesn't contribute to survival, is it necessary for local control? And of course, its importance for local control depends on the risk of nodal metastases. We have known for a long time, as illustrated in this slide, that the likelihood of nodal metastases is related to tumor size, which is shown on the x-axis. And you see that it's really only when tumors get to be 1.5 centimeters or less that the incidence of nodal metastases falls below 20%. More recently, we have learned that the likelihood of nodal metastases varies with ERPR and HER2 status as illustrated in this study. In this era of screening and breast cancer awareness, the majority of women, regardless of receptor status, do not have metastases to four or more nodes. However, as illustrated here, patients with HER2 overexpressing breast cancers, even after adjustment for other tumor features, are significantly more likely to have nodal macrometastases and to have four or more nodal macrometastases than those with ER positive or triple negative breast cancer. So the real clinical question is, if you're faced with a patient who has a clinically negative axilla on physical examination, what's the likelihood of nodal metastases? And that's illustrated in two studies from Memorial Sloan Kettering shown here. The first included 5,300 patients with T1 to T3 tumors and pre- and postmenopausal women. Macrometastases were present in only 19% of patients, and only 6% had more than two nodes containing metastases. In a study limited to postmenopausal women, macrometastases were present in 23%, and only 3.6% had pathologic N2 or N3 disease. So a physical exam tells you that the likelihood of a heavy nodal burden is low when the physical exam is normal. Can we improve upon that by using axillary ultrasound? And that's a question that was, is being asked in three ongoing prospective randomized trials, SOUND, INSEMA, and the BOOG 2013-8, in which patients with clinically node negative axillas and a clinically negative axillary ultrasound are randomized to sentinel node biopsy or no axillary surgery. The studies include patients undergoing breast conserving surgery, 
with either T1 or T1 and 2 tumors, and endpoints range from regional recurrence to invasive disease-free or distant disease-free survival. These endpoints are not available, but we can get an idea of how accurately physical exam and axillary ultrasound exclude the presence of a heavy nodal disease from reports from sound and encima of patients randomized to the sentinel node arm. Notice that the overwhelming majority of these patients are postmenopausal. They are also overwhelmingly hormone receptor positive. Macrometastases were present in 8.6% of the T1 tumors in sound and 14% of the T1 and T2 tumors in encima, but notice that three or more positive nodes were present in fewer than 1.5% of patients in either study. So we can improve upon our ability to exclude heavy nodal disease burden by adding axillary ultrasound to physical exam. So how common is nodal recurrence in the absence of axillary surgery? And this is a question that was addressed a number of years ago in the IBCSG 1093 trial, which randomized women aged 60 and older to axillary dissection or no axillary surgery. 42% of the patients had tumors greater than two centimeters in size, and the majority were ER positive and received tamoxifen. Notice that only a third of patients in this study received radiotherapy, regardless of the breast operation they had. At a median follow-up of 6.6 years, 1% of patients in the axillary dissection arm, 3% of patients in the no axillary dissection arm experienced axillary first failure, an insignificant difference. We can glean further information on the risk of axillary failure from the CALGB 9343 trial, which was a study looking at the benefit of radiotherapy in estrogen receptor positive women aged 70 and older with clinical stage one breast cancers who were receiving tamoxifen. But axillary management in this study varied from axillary dissection, where there were no axillary recurrences, to tamoxifen plus radiotherapy and no axillary surgery, where again, there were no axillary recurrences, or tamoxifen alone, where 3% of patients at a median follow-up of 12.6 years had experienced an axillary recurrence. So in selected patient subgroups, local control is readily maintained in the axilla without any axillary surgery. So what about the use of axillary surgery to determine treatment? We have accepted that sentinel node biopsy is not necessary in women aged 70 and older with hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancers that are clinical stage one or stage two. But if axillary surgery doesn't contribute to survival and isn't necessary for local control, can we expand this population who has no axillary surgery or do we need to increase the use of axillary dissection to more precisely tailor therapy? I have shown you that we can identify patients at low risk of nodal metastases, but what about the patient population where therapy is not changed by the identification of nodal metastases, a group not limited to low risk patients? So if we look first at patients with HER2 overexpressing breast cancers and current recommendations for treatment from the NCCN and the Sangalan Consensus Conference, you see that for those who have stage two or three disease, neoadjuvant therapy is the preferred approach. For those with smaller cancers, clinical stage one cancers that are node negative, the chemotherapy backbone will vary based on the identification of nodal metastases. And as I showed you before, HER2 overexpressing cancers are the cancers most likely to have nodal disease. So here, there may be a favorable risk benefit ratio for nodal staging. In contrast, when we look at triple negative breast cancer, we see that again, neoadjuvant therapy is the preferred approach for clinical stage two or three patients, and that for tumors greater than five millimeters in size, chemotherapy is routine in most settings. Therefore, nodal status is likely to have minimal impact on systemic therapy choices for patients with tumors greater than five millimeters in size who are undergoing upfront surgery. And as I showed you before, triple negative cancers are those that are least likely to have nodal metastases 
suggesting a less favorable ratio for nodal staging in this subset. Things are a little bit more complicated in the ER positive HER2 negative patients. We now recognize that while endocrine therapy is the mainstay of treatment for this patient population, that some subsets do benefit from chemotherapy. The Taylor X trial in node negative patients with recurrent scores of 11 to 25 showed no difference in nine year invasive disease free survival between those treated with endocrine therapy alone or endocrine therapy plus chemotherapy when you look at the entire study population. However, when we break this down by age, we see that as recurrence score shown on the x-axis of these graphs increases, in premenopausal women, there is a trend toward an increasing benefit of chemotherapy shown in the blue lines, whereas in postmenopausal women, we see no such trend. In contrast, in the Rxponder trial, a study of patients with metastases in one to three nodes and recurrence scores of 25 or less who were randomized to endocrine therapy alone or chemotherapy plus endocrine therapy, here we see very clear differences between the pre and the postmenopausal subsets. For postmenopausal women, there was no benefit for the addition of chemotherapy, whereas for premenopausal women, a statistically significant benefit was seen. So when we think about nodal status in ER positive HER2 negative premenopausal women, nodal metastases indicate the need for chemotherapy regardless of the 21 gene recurrence score. In node negative patients, the recurrence score result is the primary determinant of chemotherapy use. So for this patient subset, axillary staging with sentinel node biopsy remains critical for systemic therapy decision-making. In contrast, in postmenopausal women, recurrence score determines the benefit of chemotherapy in both node positive and node negative patients. So maybe axillary staging isn't necessary. But wait a minute, our expander included only patients with one to three involved nodes. So maybe patients with metastases in one or two sentinel nodes should have an axillary dissection to see if they have involvement of more than three lymph nodes. But if we look a little more closely at who was enrolled in Rx Bonder, what we see is that patients were eligible if they had sentinel node biopsy alone. And in fact, 37.4% of patients enrolled in this trial had sentinel node biopsy alone. When we look at the forest plots examining benefit of chemotherapy versus endocrine therapy alone in the postmenopausal subset, you see, first of all, that there is no evidence of chemotherapy based on the number of lymph nodes involved, ranging from one to three. And if we look at patients who had sentinel node biopsy alone versus full axillary dissection, again, we see no significant benefit for chemotherapy in the sentinel node subgroup. So if we Again, ask this question, do we need to do axillary dissection in this ER positive HER2 negative postmenopausal subset if metastases are present in one or two sentinel nodes to determine if Rx bonder applies? I would remind you that involvement of four or more nodes in clinically node negative patients with a normal axillary ultrasound is seen in fewer than 2% of patients. A substantial proportion of those enrolled in Rx bonder had sentinel node biopsy alone, and there was no trend for a benefit for chemotherapy in this subset and no trend for chemotherapy benefit as the number of nodes involved increased. So I would say that overall, the risk benefit ratio for doing axillary dissection in this large subset of postmenopausal women is unfavorable. So what about Monarch E, a trial in estrogen receptor positive HER2 negative women? that demonstrated a benefit for the addition of abemaciclib to endocrine therapy in high-risk women. The definition of high risk in this study was involvement of four or more nodes or involvement of one to three nodes and a tumor greater than five centimeters in size or a histologic grade three tumor or a KI67 greater than 20%. 
So should we be performing axillary dissection in patients who have one or two involved lymph nodes, but don't meet any of the other high risk criteria in Monarch E to see whether or not they have involvement of four or more nodes? And again, I will remind you that the likelihood of involvement of four or more nodes in a patient with a normal physical exam and axillary ultrasound is less than 2%. One could select out particularly high-risk women for axillary dissection here. Who would they be? Patients with involvement of two nodes, larger T2 tumors, grade two rather than grade one disease, and lymphovascular invasion, a combination of factors associated with a higher likelihood of additional axillary nodal metastases, where the morbidity of axillary dissection might be justified but this remains to be seen. So if that's systemic therapy, what about nodal status and radiation decision-making? We all know that nodal status is currently the major determinant of the use of regional node irradiation in patients undergoing breast conserving therapy and of the use of post-mastectomy radiotherapy. And while axillary ultrasound reliably excludes a heavy nodal disease burden, 7 to 14% of patients with T1 and T2 tumors and a negative ultrasound enrolled in sound and in SEMA had nodal macrometastases. In many settings, the presence of any nodal disease is considered an indication for regional node irradiation. I would suggest to you that if you practice in such a setting, sentinel lymph node biopsy is less morbid and most certainly less costly than giving nodal irradiation or post-mastectomy radiotherapy because of uncertainty about nodal status. On the other hand, we've known for a long time that the false negative rate of sentinel node biopsy is approximately 5%, and we don't feel compelled to radiate node negative patients because of that 5% number. I think the hope for the future is that ongoing trials attempting to refine the use of nodal radiotherapy and PMRT in biologic low-risk women may alter the current calculus that any nodal metastases are an indication for radiotherapy. So in conclusion, what I hope I have shown you today is that in small clinically node-negative cancers, a heavy axillary tumor burden is uncommon. That's based on physical exam alone and can be improved further with axillary ultrasound, and sentinel node biopsy is not needed for local control. Nodal status remains important for systemic therapy selection in some populations of breast cancer patients, including ER-positive HER2-negative premenopausal women, those with HER2 overexpressing cancers that are two centimeters or less in size who are not receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy, triple negative cancers less than five millimeters in size, and of course, after neoadjuvant therapy to determine completeness of response. For the majority of breast cancer patients, meaning ER positive postmenopausal women, nodal status is no longer the determinant of systemic therapy, but nodal metastases remain the primary determinant of the need for regional node irradiation and postmastectomy radiotherapy, and for that reason, until that changes, axillary staging is likely to stay with us. I will leave you with the thought that the genomic era does offer the opportunity for less axillary surgery in a significant number of breast cancer patients, but it will require acceptance of a somewhat greater amount of uncertainty than physicians have historically been comfortable with. I thank you for your attention and for the opportunity to give this talk today.